Canada has become a major immigration hotspot in recent years, drawing people from all over the world, particularly Latin America. Because it is simple to immigrate, there are plenty of jobs, the security is admirable, and most significantly, Canada's economy has experienced phenomenal growth, the idea of a Canadian dream is depicted here. A surge of immigrants from all around Latin America are drawn to the alluring Canadian dream. To give you an idea, there were 175,000 Latin Americans living in Canada 25 years ago. These days, there are 1 million of them. Additionally, the idea of the Canadian dream is more alluring than ever because to Latin American YouTubers who have emigrated to Canada. Who wouldn't want to move to Canada, start a business, purchase a home, and raise a family? However, this perception of Canada is risky, and outward appearances are not always reliable. The Canadian dream we all hold dear may simply be an illusion as it appears that the country's economy is experiencing some pretty serious issues. In Canada, prices have risen to previously unheard of record levels. For instance, the average monthly wage in Toronto is $4,400 Canadian, while the average rent for a one-bedroom apartment is $2,500, which is more than half of that amount. Many people have ended up living on the streets as a result of this scenario, which is totally unsustainable. Quite simply, not everything that glitters is gold. In this video, we'll examine the main economic issues Canada is currently dealing with and expose the falsehood of the Canadian dream by responding to the following query, exists the Canadian dream or is it merely a myth? Canada is one of the second largest nations in the world, after the United States and China. However, there are currently 38 million people living in Canada which is less than a tenth of the population of the United States, our neighbor. Prior to the 1982 formation of its constitution, Canada was an autonomous dominion of the United Kingdom in the early 1900s. The fact that Canada is legally a constitutional monarchy, where the British king is assumed to be the head of state, is also an odd fact. Due to the waves of immigration brought on by this connection to the UK during the 20th century, the country's population increased dramatically. Precisely, albeit on a considerably lesser scale than in the case of the United States. Canada's economy has traditionally been closely correlated with changes in the American economy. Cities close to the U.S. border, like Toronto, Montreal, and Vancouver, have been transferring a large portion of their economies to their southern neighbor since the turn of the 20th century. Since Canada is one of the world's richest nations in terms of oil, natural gas, and metals, the majority of its exports at the time were natural resources. Canada also developed as a strategic ally for the United States as the American economy expanded, particularly after World War II. This resulted in a significant economic boom for Canada. In addition to exporting natural resources at the time, Canada also started to build factories along the border that produced auto parts and succeeded in growing its aerospace sector. One of its most significant corporations is Bombardier, which you may be familiar with. One of the most well-known businesses in the aerospace sector on a global scale was this one. BlackBerry, a manufacturer of mobile phones, was another crucial technology business at the time. And thanks to this economic growth, Canada also saw a demographic boom in the late 1900s with waves of immigration from Asia, the United States and Europe. And after studying its whole history, it is clear that three factors exports to the United States, natural resource wealth, and immigration have contributed to Canada's economic prosperity. These three factors enabled Canada to become a very wealthy and industrialized country, but they are also damaging Canada's economy today. Let's discuss the first issue, its exports to the U.S., in order to comprehend its economic issues. As I previously demonstrated, Canada's economy historically relied heavily on exports to the United States. The majority of those exports were natural resources, while there were slowly growing numbers of technical businesses. Today, however, Canada continues to be heavily reliant on both its natural resource exports and its exports to the United States. Here in this chart you will see what products Canada exports. As you will see in brown, natural resource energy exports account for almost 30% of all its exports. But it doesn't stop there. 
In mustard color, in red color, in purple color, and in yellow color, you will see the other natural resources that Canada exports, such as metals, lumber, and agricultural products. That means that more than half of all of Canada's exports are in the form of natural resources. And as you'll see here, the other groups of exports are automobiles, and everything related to aerospace. In this other graph you will see the destinations of those exports. As you will see, almost 75% of all exports go to the United States, and this economic dependence that Canada is experiencing has enormous consequences. The economy of Canada is extremely susceptible to what happens in the United States, which is the most evident effect. The Canadian economy is directly impacted by any type of political upheaval, economic crises, or legislative change. Furthermore, 80% of Canada's population resides within 100 kilometers of the U.S. border, showing how significant the U.S. is to the country. Additionally, 50% of Canadians reside south of this line in the Toronto region. As a result, the United States purchases have influenced Canada, and Canada is fortunate that the United States is still the world's superpower. Therefore, this dependence has not been a significant issue, but rather the driving force behind the Canadian economy. But the fundamental issue is that Canada's economy has become mediocre as a result of its reliance on the US. Economic kinds are often divided into three categories by economists. Natural resource exporters, manufacturers of industrial goods, and providers of exports of services. Most developed economies have these three components in their economies, with a stronger emphasis on exports and services. Because of its reliance on the United States, Canada's economy hasn't been able to reach the highest level of sophistication. That's correct, the US has always viewed Canada as a minor nation from whom it purchases natural resources and derives certain advantages. As I've already demonstrated, the Canadian economy is heavily reliant on the export of natural resources to the United States. Additionally, American businesses have established themselves in Canada and conduct business with them occasionally. Meaning that, depending on the situation, Canada may offer lower taxes, less expensive labor, and other advantages. Due to this, American businesses now operate in Canada, but the US, not Canada, benefits from the innovation and technical advancement these businesses produce. And its economy reflects this. If you are enjoying this video and want to be aware of new videos, subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. Despite being a developed nation, Canada does not dominate the world in high-tech industries. It's not because these businesses are based here, but rather because the government is doing nothing to promote technical advancement. Here in this chart you will see how much Canada and the US invest in their businesses as a percentage of their economy. As you will see, Canada invests almost 9% of its economy while the US invests 14%, or almost 60% more. This has resulted in a much lower level of competitiveness in Canada than in the United States. Canada is ranked at number 14 and the United States at number 10 in the global competitiveness rating. And keep in mind that Canada was in the top 5 just 10 years ago. This is also demonstrated in its productivity. In comparison to the US economy, Canada's is less inventive and productive. An employee in the US produces around $75 per hour in productivity, while in Canada this figure drops to almost $55 per hour. And this is due to low investment in technology and development. Here you will see how much Canada has invested in development and research relative to its economy. Canada only invests 1.5% of its economy, while the United States, having an economy 10 times larger, invests almost 3.5% in technology, and this can be seen in the production of patents. Every year, the US creates approximately twice as many patents as Canada. This brings us to the second factor, natural resources, which were the Canadian economy's main driver of success as well as its main constraint. In Canada, innovation is weak because, as I've already demonstrated, natural resources account for half of all exports. There is innovation in this industry, but it is little. The fact that these resources flow to the United States is yet another major issue. 
But for years now the United States has become one of the largest producers of oil and natural gas in the world, and this oil and natural gas is extracted in a cheaper and cleaner way than in Canada. Finally, Canada today faces a very serious long-term challenge as the green and renewable industries dominate a large portion of the global economy. Yes, Canada does export metals and wood goods, but the vast majority of its income comes from the export of oil and gas. But real estate, another crucial area of the Canadian economy, is also a major source of worry. If you hope to immigrate to Canada and eventually own a home, it's possible that this may only ever be a fantasy. That's right, the majority of Canadians cannot afford the extraordinarily high cost of homes. Six out of ten Canadians, according to an Ipsos survey, have given up on the dream of home ownership. These people have given up and will now spend the rest of their days renting. Immigration in Canada's weak economy are the main causes of the skyrocketing property prices in recent decades. Here in this graph you will see two lines, the black line showing growth and income in Canada, and the red line showing house prices. As you will see, in the 1970s through the early 2000s, house prices were rising more or less in pace with income per person. But as the new millennium began, home prices skyrocketed. Today, for example, the average home in the city of Toronto is around $1.2 million. And mind you, as you will see, a couple of years ago this price was higher, almost $1.4 million. For reference, the average monthly wage in Toronto is $4,400 Canadian dollars, or $51,000 annually, in contrast, the average monthly wage in New York is $8,800 Canadian dollars, or $105,000 annually, or more than twice as much. A wage employee would not be able to afford a property in Toronto because it would cost close to 24 times his annual earnings. A one-bedroom apartment in Toronto costs, on average, $2,500 in rent, which is more than half the average wage. The big question at this point is what led to the current housing bubble. Well, the government claims that the lack of construction in Canada's growing population, which is mostly the result of immigration, are to blame. That clarifies the final economic factor, immigration, which was responsible for both the success and the failure of the Canadian economy. The Canadian government is conscious that, although having a territory bigger than that of the United States, it has a small population. They have allowed immigration in order to encourage the growth of that population. This had two sides to it. The government offered incentives to buy homes in an effort to realize the Canadian dream and bolster the growth of the real estate sector as a result of immigration, but it has not been able to build enough homes to satisfy demand. Real estate values have soared to unprecedented heights as a result of this. So, if we step back, this is the main economic issue Canada is currently facing. Due to their economy's heavy reliance on the US, they have shifted their economic priorities to selling to the US. Their economy has been average since they have mostly exported natural resources and have not allowed it to expand technologically. Additionally, these Canadian exports are in peril now that the United States is a significant producer of oil and natural gas. Last but not least, immigration had a role in Canada's prosperity but also had the unintended consequence of driving up real estate prices to unaffordable levels. That is the depressing truth of life in Canada. If you immigrate to Canada, you will notice that housing costs there are exorbitant, as are rentals obviously, while incomes there are regrettably lower than in the United States. As a result, the notion of the Canadian dream is probably a myth. This does not necessarily imply that it won't be doable. It will be exceedingly challenging, but not impossible, to own your own home. It will also be challenging, but not impossible, to become wealthy via your work. But it's also crucial to stress that Canada has advantages. First off, social benefits are substantially better in Canada than they are in the US. In Canada, public health care is the norm, and there are countless welfare benefits. Additionally, Canada has a significantly better work-life balance than the US. Finally, Canada has significantly greater safety standards than the US. But all of that leads me to ask you, would you prefer to immigrate to Canada or the United States? Leave us your opinion in the comments.